when you do that intro 15 times in a week, it gets just crazy. You just come to love it. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending on where you're joining from. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And first and foremost, it is just so nice to have you guys back in the classroom. I know it's been a crazy six or eight months or so, uh, but we really appreciate not only having amazing YouTube and Facebook groups joining in live from around the world, but having actual students in actual classrooms all doing a great job with masks and social distancing and all that good stuff, but still joining us to highlight some of the world's top scientists, explorers, conservationists, and cool groups. So thank you guys so much, and I'm excited to get started. So September is our month highlighting ocean and microplastics. We are going in headlong with this. I think we've got 15 programs in the month on the topic, and it's something that's a really big issue that a lot of people are you know, seeking to understand more about and trying to get their head around generally uh, these days. So we, we love the chance to highlight that. We've got some really cool resources you might have checked out on our newsletter as well. So today we are joined live in Georgia by Catherine Youngblood. So she is a research engineer. Um, she is a marine citizen science debris tracking director. She gets to travel the world and explore and seek to understand the problem of marine plastics getting to the ocean and what we can do about it and how to educate the public about it. So all around, we couldn't have a better person exploring this topic with us. And I'm thrilled to bring in uh, Catherine. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and uh, can't wait to dive in with your talk. Thank you, happy to be here. All right, let me get my slides up sharing here. All right. Awesome. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah, you're perfect and good to go. And uh, let's do it. All righty, cool. So as as thank you for the introduction. Um, as, as we said, I'm a research engineer at the University of Georgia and the citizen science director for Marine Debris Tracker. I also got to participate in a National Geographic expedition last year along the Ganges River, traveling from the Bay of Bengal up to the Himalayas to study plastic pollution around the around, along the river. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about that expedition, what we did there, and also Marine Debris Tracker, our citizen science project and how you can start your own expedition in your own backyard to learn about plastic pollution in your neighborhood. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about my background first. So I'm an environmental engineer by training. I, I studied engineering because I was really fascinated with this idea that uh, we can we can change something in a system and end up helping and impacting so many people's lives. And I thought that was really, really cool. So I studied engineering, but I'm also a scuba diver for fun. And so I, I did one dive off the coast of Honduras after it had rained a lot. And um, that day we were, we were diving through the water and you could see the little bits of floating plastic um, just floating in the across the water there as we were diving and it really inspired me to start thinking about what are what are the systems around plastic that are making it end up leaking into our environment and end up impact impacting ecosystems in our environment. And so because of that, I got to study uh, plastic pollution, as I mentioned, along the Ganges and study the systems that cause plastic pollution and also what systems are working. So this is a picture of talking to um, informal recyclers in India where, where we were looking at uh, what materials they were recycling and making money off of and what materials they weren't. So, but back to debris tracker. So as part of our expedition, we also looked at what kind of litter was actually on the ground. And that's what the debris tracker app is designed to do. So Marine Debris Tracker is a, a citizen science project and it's all open data. So when you collect data with the app, you're collecting geospatial data on what litter is in your community, what kind of plastic pollution is in your community. And then it's all uploaded to this online map that anybody can look at. So anyone is, um, can get on there and play with the data and see what they've collected in their own backyard, but then also see what other citizen scientists are collecting. So we really believe that this, this open data, that the sharing this data all together will allow us to create better solutions to plastic pollution. Um, plastic pollution does look different in different parts of the world, and we really think it's important to have everybody contributing to that bigger picture of plastic pollution so that we can understand it and start to move towards solutions. 
So we have on, on the Debris Tracker app, we've had over two and a half million items logged in 90 countries around the world. So it is a really a big and growing project, but plastic pollution is a big and growing problem. And so we really need to continue building this database to be able to understand how plastic pollution is changing as more products and different types of plastic products come into the come into the market and end up littered in the environment. So I'm going to try to play you this video. Uh, hopefully the sound should work, but do let me know if there's any issues and you can't hear it, all right? We might be able to get this going. I fell in love with the study of solid waste because it so closely involves people. Every day we decide what to buy, what to consume, and then we have to choose if we're going to recycle something, compost something, or put it in the trash. Unfortunately, some of our items still end up in the environment. Every minute, the equivalent of a dump truck worth of plastic enters our oceans. As researchers, we study plastic pollution all around the world, and this is a global problem. But I think there's this tendency to think of it as something that's far away and far removed from us. But there's nowhere on the planet that's not touched by the water cycle. So plastic pollution can start right in our own backyards. But so can the solutions. Scientists need data on what's ending up in the environment so that we can use that data to inform upstream solutions. But they can't collect this data without your help. The first iteration of Marine Debris Tracker was actually on a personal digital assistant. My students went out and collected litter items with exact GPS coordinates, and we could look at the distribution and change of litter on a coastline over time. When smartphones came out, it became possible to collect this type of data on a wider scale, and so we thought there should be an app for that. Debris Tracker is an open data citizen science movement. We're committed to sharing our data because we believe this problem will be solved more quickly when we work together. When you use the app, the geospatial litter data you collect is uploaded to our publicly accessible database. Scientists, policymakers, educators, or anyone around the world can download and analyze your data to inform their solutions. There's power in numbers, which is why we rely on a community of people just like you to collect this data. The app is free and easy to use, so anyone can become a citizen scientist. Wherever you are in the world, every piece of data that you collect is a piece of the puzzle illustrating the plastic pollution problem. So please join our open data citizen science movement by collecting litter in your community today and help us answer these three questions. What is it? How did it get there? And together, what can we do about it? Right. Awesome. So hopefully that gives you a little bit better idea of what Debris Tracker is all about. I'm going to walk through really quickly what the app actually looks like in practice and how it looks when you're collecting data with it. Um, but I will reference that we do have a lot of materials on our website, including a tutorial video and a guidebook. So if you do have any more questions beyond what this quick presentation is, definitely check that out. So Debris Tracker, when you open it up, you click Start Tracking, and then you'll see a list of a bunch of different projects. So we create these customized litter, littered lists for different organizations who are tracking in different parts of the world and are seeing different kinds of litter and who are um, looking or, or tracking in different languages. So we, we customize the list for those different kind of projects. And so you pick, we, we recommend the, the NOAA list if you're tracking in the U.S. or in North America. It's a good a good one to start with. It's a widely accepted methodology. Um, and so then once you select the list, you click start tracking and you can log in, create an account. And then you also see um, the list of different litter items available on the app. So when you, whenever you see an item, you just type, you click how many there are, and then you click add. And every time you click add, it's creating a point that says when, what kind of item you found, where you found it, what time it was. And that's really good detailed data that scientists can then look at to try to get to understand this bigger picture of plastic pollution. And then once you're done, you just submit that data and it's uploaded to our database that I talked about earlier. 
Um, so I wanted to talk through a few case studies of how we use the app. I mentioned we used it on the expedition, and I think that's a really uh, cool case study to get to talk about a little bit more. So this is data from our expedition across up the Ganges. And this these are 10 different sites that we stopped at along the way. And you can see the different litter densities we found. So the way that we did uh, litter transects was we we did a, a linear transect so that means we measured one meter wide by a hundred meters long typically along a roadway or a path um, and then we counted every single litter item and recorded every litter item within that path but there are lots of different ways you can do a litter expedition you could time uh, set a timer for 20 minutes and see how much litter you can find in that time uh, you could measure out a different kind of area like you know uh, um, like a local park area or, uh, you know, along a road. So there are lots of options of ways that you can do your own kind of litter expedition. Um, this is a, uh, we did a lot of measuring of, of dump sites and other kind of plastic pollution sites in India. And, but, and as part of collecting this data, we also got to work with students in classrooms in India to collect the data, which was really exciting. So they used a paper data card that's a version of the debris tracker app, um, but they did the, the same thing that we did and, and walked through the process of how to collect data on plastic pollution and then how to think use that data to think about solutions. So to use that data to look at what's there, um, why is it there? And then asking what can we do about it to change the kind of plastic we're seeing ending up on the ground in our own communities. Um, and we, as part of that effort, we did create some really cool educational resources that I'll definitely share the link with you guys so you can access. So we have um, on this on this Nat Geo Debris Tracker website, we have a plastic pollution action journal, which walks you through kind of how we think about litter as scientists. So how we look at, at how plastic is used and what data is out there on plastic, and then how we go from that to thinking about um, what kind of solutions we can implement to change to change what's ending up on the ground. All right, that's my my quick overview presentation. Fantastic. Catherine, that was great. That really is actually one of the more beautiful presentations I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Computer, that's awesome. I've got a bunch of the links that you already talked about and some more that we've highlighted in other projects that I'll be bringing up throughout the broadcast as we get questions that undoubtedly will cover those topics. Uh, so what I want to do now is dive in with questions. If you're joining on YouTube or Facebook, let me know where you're joining from anywhere in the world. We'd love to hear about that. Uh, and then share your questions in the chat bar. It'll all pop up for me here and I can share with Catherine. And for our live classes, Miss Matson's class in Green River, Wyoming, you guys are just pouring in. That's awesome. Uh, but let's go to Hillfield in Hamilton. If you guys have a question to kick us off, come on up. All right. Does anybody have a question? I'm going to start while these guys are just thinking, if you don't mind. Go for sure. it. Um, so COVID has really thrown uh, our whole system of schooling into a loop. But the opportunity we have this year, which is pretty exciting for me, is I've been able to become a core teacher which basically means I'm teaching math and science and English, and I don't have to jump around in all these geography classes. So one of the things we're gonna be working on this year is a passion project. Uh, one of the things that came up when we were talking about this morning uh, was, was plastics and the plastic problem. I know a couple of my students kind of had some interest. How did you get your passion for plastic? Is there any ways or anything that you can say to encourage the students to get a passion for something that they're interested in? I'm just kind of looking for some spark because I can see you're pretty interested about solving one of these world problems. And that's the only thing yeah. that said is the key, you know, solving one of the world issues, questions or problems that we have. Yeah, I think one of the things that is really inspiring to me about plastic in particular is that because it is, you know, plastic is really a, a miracle material. It's something that's in so many different items that we use every day. Um, it, you know, it's really lightweight, it's really cheap, it's really durable. And those are the things that make it so prevalent in manufacturing, but they're also um, the things that make it really detrimental when it ends up in the environment and when it stays in the environment and impacts ecosystems. And so for me, I found that to be the fact that it is so widespread 
to be really inspiring because it means there's a lot of opportunity for solutions there. There's not just a one fit size fits all solution. It's not just um, something that has to start upstream. It can start with our individual actions. Um, and that includes, you know, helping collect data on the problem, on what the problem looks like in your area, and also uh, includes, you know, what choices you make about how you use plastic. So I think really, for me, the key was feeling really um, like I could make a difference in that space, you know, that, and I think, I think we underestimate how much power we do have to make a difference in these problems that seem, you know, big, overwhelming global type problems, but a lot of them really do start at the local level, especially environmental problems. And they start with our own choices in some ways, you know, there's big systematic impacts, but we have a lot of power to influence a lot of the systems in the world and kids, especially like, I think that it's really inspiring for people when, when kids uh, come up with ideas and create, create solutions and collect data. Um, I think you, you can't underestimate how much, uh, you know, the adults in your life and, and the adults in your community will respond to um, your passion about a project. Yeah. Fantastic answer. And what I'd like to highlight to high schoolers, middle school students, uh, both of which we have today, is that it's literally the best time ever to be a student that is interested in, like, has a passion project. I mean, I think everyone thought it was going to be my generation that was going to be leading the charge, doing all this stuff. And it's it's yours. I mean, you can look at Greta Thunberg. You can look at million, you know, child marches all around the world. I mean, there's some really, really great stuff going on to, you know, inspire you guys and uh, highlight your impact. Catherine, really quickly, before we go to a second question, you did something that almost none of our speakers do, and I want to harp on it for a second, which is mention that plastic is a good thing, too. I think we get really caught up in you know these challenges and problems, and it's really easy to vilify. Oh, anyone who uses plastic is bad. It is good for so many reasons, and we didn't know the threats originally. We're just starting to learn this in a big way in the last 20 years, and I think that that's a really nice thing to start with that as a, a backdrop. That you know, This wasn't people being evil. This is all trying to make the world a better place. We realize there's some challenges associated with it, and now we can take action to help that. So thank you for that message. Um, let's go to Ms. Matson's class in Green River, Wyoming, grade 11. So if you guys want to come up for a second question, uh, go for it. Just demute your mic, and you'll be good to go. Oh, but you will need to demute your mic, Ms. Matson. Your microphone's off, and I can't do it if you de mute it yourself. Yeah, <laughs> every teacher can keep their mic on. You're all good. Yeah, all right. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Thanks, Jesse. All right. Um, so we are currently involved in the Citizen Science Backyard Bio Project, but we do have two local field trips coming up next week to different locations of our river, the Green River. And so my question to you is just what – can we do as a class or what can I do with my class to um, make this field trip like impactful, like local to global? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, we, I mean, we definitely would love for you guys to collect data while you're out there on the river. I do think uh, river systems are a really important tie in from most of our regular daily lives to the ocean, you know, that's the conveyor belt that's moving plastic from our communities into the ocean. Um, so it is a, a re it really does tie into ocean pl plastic in this very direct way. Um, uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend collecting data. I think it is a really cool way to be able to quantify your impact because uh, I'm not sure how many kids are in your class, but even multiplying out, you know, a few, a few people collecting 10, 20 items a piece, you can really get a lot of data. Um, and, you know, you're keeping that out, that plastic out of the environment. And then you're also getting a really interesting look at what are the problem materials in your own area. Um, and that's the cool thing about Debris Tracker is that you can have that really local focus of, of doing those small projects for your own area and looking at that data, understanding what it means for your local area. But you're also contributing to this big global database. Um, so our goal is to continue to support these sort of local initiatives. And through doing that, we really hope that we can have enough people interested and build a big enough database that we're able to do a global level analysis on the citizen science data. But it really takes a, a village to be able to do that. It takes a lot of people tracking and contributing before we're able to get to that level of um you know, enough data, but I think that's really cool that you can use it for your own uh, local understanding of the problem in your own backyard uh, without waiting for that global impact level. 
Yeah. One of the things that your talk also did, and you've highlighted in that answer too, that's so neat is just highlighting the importance of data in general. I think if you're, you know, when I was in high school, someone said to me, oh, you know, if you collect a bit of information about some trash or about species that live near you, I'd be like, okay, well, what's the point? But it's exactly that point that if you have 20 kids in a class and you have a few hundred classes doing that and they're all around the world, that's a substantial amount of information that we can use to make public policy decisions, that we can use to clean things up. So it's really, really important and it absolutely has a huge impact. So. Great stuff. Um, let's go back to Hamilton. If you guys have another question, again, YouTube, don't be shy. We'd love to see your questions. Uh, but Hamilton, for now, he'll ask a question. Go for it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Nathan ask the question because he posed it here. Perfect. So here you go, Nathan. What has COVID-19 done to cost pollution in the ocean? Has it increased it or decreased the amount of plastic that has been put into the ocean? That's a great question, and it's one we don't know the answer to 100% yet because it is such a recent phenomenon, and because this effort of collecting data about plastic pollution takes a long time and takes a lot of people contributing. Um, but I can tell you that we have had a lot more people on the Debris Tracker app collecting data about uh, types of PPE that they're finding littered, you know, masks, disposable gloves, wet wipes, those kind of items that we're using more of are ending up littered more. So unfortunately, um, the way that we tend to use plastic, the way we tend to use most materials, um, some of it will end up littered. So whatever we're using, some of it is going to end up littered. The, the litter that you see on the ground is a reflection of what people are using in that area, right? Um, so because people are now using more masks and more um, disposable gloves, more disposable wipes, we're seeing more of those on the ground. Um, there are definitely other options. I think there are a lot of other alternatives like reusable masks that don't necessarily have to have plastic involved with them. Um, and so I think we're, we're, you know, obviously safety was such a big concern right when this was just starting and still is. And so we're still trying to figure out how to balance the plastic usage with uh, making sure we're maintaining health and safety at the highest level possible. But we don't know yet what what that the choice to use more plastic materials in in things like masks and disposable gloves, what impact that will have on the ocean. We're just not sure yet because we've also seen a decrease in people, you know, right. um, going to the beach recreationally. And so that's something that tends to um, leave, you know, people leave litter and things get dropped. And so then things end up in the ocean that way as well. So um, yeah, that we'll have to collect more data to be able to answer that question, unfortunately. Yeah, no, I think that's great. You know, we don't necessarily have all the answers and we can highlight that and, it, you know, undercuts them or not undercuts, it amplifies the message of the importance of going out and collecting data as a classroom. By the way, if you guys are looking for reusable masks, everyone should get a cool chameleon mask like the student that asked that question because that was one of the coolest masks I've seen all month long, so way to go. Um, one other thing I, I wanna bring up while we're here is a name at the bottom of your screen, Justine Amandalia. So she's a marine plastics researcher, and this is literally what she's doing right now. She's in Toronto like me. She's going around collecting information on all the PPE that has been dropped on the ground and working with the federal government of Canada to help highlight that. So you can check out her work. She's done some exploring about the seat of your pants presentations with us, and it's a, a really, really awesome initiative. So great question, guys. She's using the Debris Tracker app, and they have a group of people around the country and around different other other countries uh, that are collecting data on the PPE they're seeing in the litter with Debris Tracker. You yeah. know what? That's actually a, a great opportunity to highlight. Um, you know, you talk about collecting this data, and it's all around the world. Are there research labs all around the world that are, you know, collecting this, collating it, and then partnering with one another to make positive change? So as a researcher yourself, University of Georgia, do you partner with other universities in Canada, the U.S., and, and worldwide? Yeah, definitely. So so our goal uh, for the app, for the Citizen Science Project, is to support local organizations that are collecting this data. So that's everything from researchers and universities to classrooms to, you know, we have some uh, or classroom groups that have gotten together and have started collecting data. We have nonprofit organizations, all kinds of a big variety of volunteer groups that we're working with um, to be able to collect this data. So we kind of partner with, we find people who are excited about collecting data and we work with them to make sure that we're um, giving them customized lists and giving them data resources that, that they need to be able to um, meet their own 
local goals for what they're trying to do with their data while simultaneously um, collecting this big picture data that we can use for global level analysis. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a little bit of everything from people who are tracking. I mean, we really do run the gamut of having a, a big different, a big varied group of people tracking. And I think that's what's really cool about citizen science is it's not just researchers and universities that can do this kind of work. It's, you know, it's everybody. I mean, we really do have a big variety of people who are collecting data. Yeah, I think if, if anyone in their lives can be as excited as Catherine is about collecting data, you are set. Like if you can just be that passionate, that's awesome. Um, speaking of which, citizen science, this month we've covered, uh, Ms. Madsen already mentioned backyard bio, we'll cover that at the end. There's penguin tracker we covered. Uh, Zooniverse is a, a really large collection of some amazing citizen science projects. So I'll put that in the bottom of the screen in a minute. Uh, but if you're really looking to count penguins or count meteorites or find things or really contribute to actual science projects. There's a ton out there now. It's a really exciting time to be a student. Uh, with that, let me go back to Ms. Matson's group. Your mic is good. So if you want to ask us another question, go for it. Okay, question. Question. Lynette asked, and if none at all, that's totally fine. <laughs> well, I actually have another question. Then. Um, <laughs> I am full of them. Um, so speaking about um, like tracking debris and tracking, are you looking specifically at plastics or any type of, of litter? Um, and then with that, have you seen anything, any type of results that affect like the, the organisms that live in along river systems or in the rivers like the invertebrates or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we we do focus on more than just plastics, and that's really to be able to get a baseline to compare are plastics really littered more or is littering generally a problem? And we see plastic because it's part of the stuff that we use. Um, so yeah, we do collect data on everything. Um, some of our top items are, are not plastic. Some of them are paper items. Um, paper litter or uh, even we've seen cloth, rubber, glass, those kind of items also end up littered. Um, but far and away, the, the vast majority is plastic. And I think that's why we end up talking about it more. You know, marine debris does not just mean plastic. It can mean a lot of different kinds of litter, but plastic has, you know, time and time again in our data and in the International Coastal Cleanup ocean data that Ocean Conservancy does every year. Um, we, we see plastic rising to the top of the list, and it also has some of the biggest environmental concerns. Some of those other materials like paper and glass do eventually break down in the environment and plastic, we're just still not sure. We, we think it mostly photodegrades, breaks down into tiny pieces rather than actually biodegrades. And so um, the, the potential impacts on the ecosystem are a lot, potentially a lot bigger than paper or glass or other kind of items. Um, that was the first part of your question. And then the second part of your question was, remind me again one more time. <laughs> yeah, bring her back. Okay. So the second part of the question had to do with, um, so we know I have heard a lot of research about, um, like plastic pollutions or even pollutions like for affecting ocean animals, but yeah. have you seen any effects on like the, the organisms that live along river systems and right, so right. speaking to like anything about like the macro invertebrates. Mm -hmm. That is a really good question. I think, uh, so yeah, you're definitely right. We have seen a lot of uh, data and, and papers come out on the impacts of plastic on marine animals, so animals in the ocean. Um, with Marine Debris Tracker, we did have a, a paper published a few years ago that the Jackal Island Sea Turtle Center, which is down on the coast of Georgia, they had uh, citizen scientists use the app to collect data on plastic pollution, and they were able to publish um, a paper about how that plastic pollution is potentially impacting the sea turtle nesting beaches there on the island. Um, but river systems are really kind of a, a new field in, in this space um, because oceans are the sink, because oceans are where stuff is ending up. We kind of knew about plastic pollution being a problem there first. Um, but now we're finding that plastic pollution is really a problem a lot more broadly than we thought it was. Uh, We've seen, you know, articles like the um, 
the plastic snow coming down in some of the really high mountains, uh, all kinds of you know plastic particles being blown about by the wind. So we're learning that plastics reach is really a lot. I mean, there's really no place on the planet that's not touched by it. Unfortunately, they found it, you know, in the deepest trenches of the ocean and on really tall mountains and national parks. Like it's a very broad spread impact. And we haven't quantified what that impact is on the, on all of those different ecosystems. I think for rivers, it's a little difficult because the plastic is moving. Uh, typically rivers are kind of that, that conveyor belt that's actually carrying plastic into the ocean. And so unlike the ocean, it's not just, you know, staying there. Obviously stuff moves around and currents carry it in the ocean, but um, in the rivers, it's typically a lot of it's being moved and washed down river into the ocean. So it, it is difficult to study something that, um, is transient like that, but we're still still working on quantifying impacts of, of on the ecosystem of what that looks like. But we do know that you know we we're getting more data, getting more information on on um, how microplastics and how um, plastics are impacting species in the ocean. And it, it's not a huge lo jump of logic to think that some of those same impacts are very likely to be happening um, on organisms in the rivers as well but again because because it's moving um you know plastic plastic does take a while to break down even in the environment and so it when it's moving from the river to the ocean and breaking down into microplastics you know that takes time and so if it's not in one place long enough to break down um you might see some differences in how that how that actually shakes out in terms of what kind of uh you know what kind of impacts you're seeing on an ecosystem level yeah um that's that, that covered all of it. that was great Catherine. uh i do want to highlight two other things about rivers really quickly one is uh we've actually the only program we've ever had specifically on river plastics was with a, a plastics researcher at the university of toronto named rachel giles so the youtube link is there and i will pass this to all our registered classes as well uh, it was a really really good program and she specifically highlighted fibers from clothes and tires as being major causes of plastics getting into the ecosystem, so you can check that out. And secondly, if you're looking for one of the coolest, most fun uh, cleanup activities that you can check out uh, a social media thing on, Mr. Trash Wheel in the Baltimore Harbor is one of the most fun activities. Like it's just, it's such a brilliant idea because it not only cleans up trash, but also, you know, engages the community behind it. So I will also share that with all our classrooms, Mr. Trash Wheel. Rachel Giles, do check those things out. And what I wanna do now, uh, before we go back to our live classes for another round of questions is share this one. I love it, coming all the way from Algeria. Uh, so welcome in Ghazali. Um, what can we do with all the plastics or microplastics we collect? If we're picking this stuff up, what should we do with it? That's a great question. It really depends on where you are. So this is another thing, much like plastic pollution, that is very local. So um, I definitely, if you can recycle some of the plastic that you find, definitely try to recycle it. But what is recyclable is different in different places. And, and even what you do to recycle it is different. So you'll have to check with your local municipality or any local um, organizations that are collecting plastic. Other than that, um, other plastic and microplastic is is best off in a sanitary landfill. Um, some some countries use incinerators, but those have other consequences. So um, most uh, you know, sort of the the best option, which isn't a very good option that we've found so far, is to put plastic in a big hole in the ground to line it with um, you know, a, to basically we put a lining on the bottom of a landfill so that nothing uh, leaches out into the environment and. And then we put, we fill trash in there and then we cover it with dirt. And then we do that every day, fill it with trash and cover it with dirt. And that's sort of the system that we have right now of what we actually do with our trash, which isn't very advanced. It isn't very high tech. And it's certainly not, um, certainly not capturing all the valuable materials that are um, in plastic and in other kinds of, you know, metal, uh, glass, all of those things are, are valuable materials that have taken a lot of energy to extract from the earth and create those things. Um, and so I'm, I'm really hopeful. I have, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of the concept of the circular economy, but basically the idea is that we should move more towards a system where instead of putting things in this, you know, big hole in the ground and covering it up, we should, uh, you know, find better ways to recycle and to reuse and to create systems that are better geared towards um you know not losing that value of that of the plastic or of other materials um in in a landfill so 
right now we don't have a great place to put plastic, but uh, a landfill is your best option if, if you have access to waste management services like that. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. A couple notes to follow up on with that. One is I'll bring it up on the screen. Uh, National Geographic for over a year now has been doing their Planet or Plastic initiative, which almost fits in that banner perfectly, but doesn't. Um, so I would encourage anyone to check that out. There's some amazing resources on there, information on the circular economy and so much more that Catherine's touched upon today. So do check that out. And one other note mentioned in that geo and a bunch of other things right now is uh, with regards to picking up plastic, I walk around my block and I typically pick up trash and I, I bring it back and put it in my garbage bin. Now might not be the best time to do that. So National Geographic has highlighted uh, that you should definitely observe, uh, you know, use debris tracker, highlight what you find. But for safety reasons right now, not necessarily the best time to be picking stuff up unless you have really safe gear to do so. Um, so we'd like to just issue that caveat, but uh, I really... A fantastic story uh, generally. Another quick note, uh, Catherine, you mentioned sanitary landfills, which you're the first person I think ever to mention that in the history of the program, uh, which is amazing. And I love, that increasingly there are stories of, of major cities that are, you know, creating these very, you know, as sanitary as possible landfills, using the gas that's created from them, which is a really neat other topic that we could touch upon. And then yeah. building parks ultimately on top of them. So Toronto in the West End and East End have major parks that are built on top of what used to be landfills. Um, and I think we're seeing this around the world. You might know more about that than, than I would if you care to share before we dive sure. back in. Yeah, so so sanitary landfills uh, uh, typically after um, after they're closed, so after they fill up. So we you start by digging a big hole in the ground to start a sanitary landfill, and then you typically fill it up over the top of the hole. So you've probably seen them if you've ever you know driven down the interstate and noticed a kind of giant mountain uh, that doesn't look quite natural. A lot of those are actually landfills, and um, you can't build. There's a lot of things you can't build on top of the old landfill. So you can't build, you know, apartment buildings. You can't build um, retail shops. There's a lot of things that, you know, where people would have high exposures to uh, things coming off of that landfill. You're not allowed to build those there. But they're great things for um, things like baseball fields, parks, um, things that aren't going to are, aren't going to interfere with what's underneath. Um, it can become really nice, like cool green space for for different cities. So, yeah, that right. is um, is one kind of positive, I guess, of landfills is it does preserve sort of open green space for for use in some cities. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Catherine. All right, we're going to go back to each class one more time before we wrap up. I'll also bring up a video that uh, Catherine just shared with me in the chat, so you can check that out too. Some other really great information. I'll put that in the chat as well. Uh, so we'll go back to Hamilton first. You guys have another question for us? Yes, we do. I'm going to introduce Maggie here. So I have a question that we already have the data of plastic. Uh, do we have a next step? such as what can we do as students during this COVID to prevent more plastic um, plastic in our community or in our school? Fantastic. That is a good question, Maggie. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think that one of the things that is really cool about data is you would be surprised by how much more likely people are to listen to you if you have data to back up what you're saying, right? So. If, if you can collect data on what the plastic problem is in your community and then take it back to leaders in your community, to policymakers, businesses, to your own school and show them what you're finding and, and give them ideas about how they can change it. I think Jesse said this earlier, but I, you know, I don't think that people are generally trying to um, pollute the earth. Uh, sometimes people just aren't aware of other options. But I think as students, you do have a really powerful voice to be able to you know, share data, share other options with people and make change in your community. Definitely don't underestimate your ability to just use your voice as a, as a, um, you know, a way to share other options because there are a lot of alternatives to plastic that are coming on the market now. Yeah. Well, alternatives is one of the things that we've covered a lot in our broadcast over the last two weeks. Uh, you know, you can use a reusable straw, you can bring a litterless lunch, you can not you know, use a plastic bag when you go to the grocery store. These simple solutions, again, when compounded over tens or thousands of people, uh, really make a huge impact. And you see this with plastic bag bans, plastic bag 
fees in, in various municipalities around the world. So the benefit of this is that no one looks at a beach covered in plastic and goes, great, that's fantastic. Everyone recognizes that's a problem. So it's a completely apolitical issue. We all see the, the need for change and everyone's small things can actually make a big difference. So we've covered those in a few of our other broadcasts, uh, National Geographic's resources, Ocean Wise's plastic resources and more, all have some really easy tips for the classroom. So if you guys do that, if you start adopting that and bring little to lunches, we'd love to see that. Share that with us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Share that at Marine Debris Tracker. We'd love to see how you guys are inspired to take action in your classrooms. All right, so let's take one more question from Ms. Matson's group. I know you're grade 11s, but if you have any, uh, don't be shy. <laughs> and, uh, and if not, Ms. Matson is more than enough enthusiasm for all of you. So we're all for that. <laughs> We got a student. Yes. We have a student, yes. Here we right? go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, will a ban on plastic straws help like reduce the plastic pollution in the ocean? That is a good question. And and has been uh, a somewhat controversy over the past couple of years. I'm sure you've probably seen uh, plastic bans popping up in different communities around the country and around the world. And so here's the deal with that straw bans. Um, the reason straw bans are useful is because straws can be a very negative thing when they do leak into the environment. I'm sure some of you probably saw that terrible video of the straw that was stuck in the sea turtle's nose. And I think that was kind of a sparking factor in starting a lot of these conversations is that we realize that straws, when they do get into the environment, they're very rigid, they're very small, they're something that animals can eat and consume and accidentally ingest. And so um, when they do end up in the environment, it is a big problem, right? And uh, for that reason, I think it is uh, useful to look at either what we can do to change that, you know, just switching to a method where you have to ask for a straw instead of automatically receiving one in a restaurant that can reduce consumption a lot. Um, you know, paper straws, uh, people, some people do also need straws. So, you know, there are other options like metal straws or even plastic reusable straws. There's a lot of options out there. Um, and but some communities obviously have chosen to go with a ban with exceptions for people who need straws. Um, yeah, but as far as actually reducing the amount of plastic in the ocean, straws are a really tiny percentage of the plastic that we're using, right? And so you, you're not going to see huge, you know, drastic in, in decreases in how much plastic is going in because you cut out straws. But the impacts to species could be a lot bigger. So you know, if a if a if a certain kind of sea animal is more likely to consume a straw than they are to consume, you know, a plastic bag or something else, you might see bigger impacts from, um, bigger impacts on that particular species from banning straws versus banning something else or versus doing nothing, right? Um, however, there is the concern again with plastics all break down kind of the same and we still don't completely understand uh, how those microplastics impact uh, species and animals. We know that some animals are consuming those. And so um, at that level, the, we really do have to look at the bigger picture of not just the item that can impact animals immediately, but what's impacting the ecosystem on the whole. And there's a lot of plastic items that are of concern when it comes to that. This has been great, Catherine. I'm sure we could talk all day. We have a, a great bunch of great questions from all our classes uh, online as well. So thank you guys so, so much for that. Uh, before we wrap up, before I last ask for like a last message on plastic, uh, Ms. Matson already mentioned this. I want to highlight, you know, our own citizen science project we've got going on right now. So Backyard Bio, all month long, we're encouraging classes to get out, explore the nature near them, share what they find uh, on Twitter, on iNaturalist, which is new to a lot of classes, but is a really exciting application, uh, and together with other classrooms jointly just to share the different biodiversity from around the world. So if you haven't registered, you can do so really easily on backyardbio.net. We'd love to see what you guys have to share. And uh, thanks to Ms. Matson for the shout out. So Catherine, before we wrap up, is there a last message you want to share? We, we've covered so much today, how kids can take part, what they can do, what that impact can be, um, anything to, to wrap us up with. 
Sure, I'll, I'll go back to what I touched on at the beginning, but that really it's all about the context of how plastic is used within a system, right? If we're if we're using it um, in a way where we're using it over and over again, it's being reused, and when we're done with the product, it ends up, you know, going back to who made it and being made into a new product. In that case, plastic is not a problem. But we have to look at at what in the system that we're currently doing with plastic, what is causing it to us to to take something out of the ground uh, that's been in the ground for millions of years and then to extract it and create a product and then to use it for three minutes and dispose of it and then that can end up leaking into the environment. So it's really about we have to look at the big picture and the big context of how we use plastic. Plastic is not evil in and of itself. It's how we use it. Outstanding. Catherine, thank you so, so much for a fantastic presentation today. Uh, what we're going to do, what we do at the end of every broadcast is I'll bring in the Hamilton class and the Green River class. If you guys want to join me in saying a huge thank you to Catherine for joining us today You're in the okay. broadcast. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. We'll see you all soon, everyone. Looking, uh, stay tuned for that email and all the cool resources. Catherine, this was great. Thank you so, so much again. Thank you. Thank you.